Go. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Hale, and I am so excited to introduce this session to you today. You are about to learn from two of the most brilliant people I know, Frankie Siberson and Bill Bass. Um, if you don't already know them, you should immediately follow them on Twitter, check them out on Choice Literacy, and check out their books. Frankie and Bill are two people I used to actually admire and basically stalk them on Twitter because of the amazing things they were doing in the world of digital literacy. Um, but because of social media and conferences like NCTE, Bill and Frankie have become mentors and friends, and so I'm just so honored to introduce them today to you guys. I think what I love most about these two is that while they are so passionate about technology and so knowledgeable, um, they value uh, the most important thing at the end of the day, which is instruction and our children. So they integrate technology in the reading and writing classroom by making sure you know that the readers are learning in authentic ways, the readers become very intentional in what they do as readers, and they learn to be connected to not just the students in their classroom, but the world um, beyond the four walls of their classroom. So they also just published an amazing book called Digital Reading, published by NCTE. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out, because it's probably the most practical uh, book that gives you real classroom examples of how to create a reading and writing culture for your students that doesn't just replace technology with what you have in your classroom, but provides this perfect balance, bringing in technology um, that um, enhances what you can do in the classroom for your students and keeps good instruction as the focus. So you guys really are in for a treat today, and um, I'm going to stop talking so that we can go ahead and let Bill and Frankie inspire us. Thanks, Catherine. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so, as as Catherine was saying, my name is Bill Bass. Um, I am a I have a very long and made up title, but I am my title is actually I'm an innovation coordinator for instructional technology information and library media, um, and that is ridiculous. I'm in out of St. Louis, Missouri, and basically what that means is I have the opportunity to work with teachers around my district and really talk to them about how to use technology effectively in classrooms and how to keep kids at the forefront of that conversation. And so um, I am a recovering English teacher. Um, I taught high school English for many, many years. And in that process, I, I experimented and learned with, about technology. And that really got me on my path to using technology and, and basically being able to do this job. So I want to give Frankie a moment to uh, go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, um, I'm Frankie Severson. I um, teach third grade in Dublin, Ohio. Um, so this is my third year in third grade. Most of my experience is in grades three to five, so I'm pretty interested in how this digital piece is um, affecting literacy. I'm, I'm not really tech savvy. Um, I don't like the tech detail part of it, but I love the literacy part thinking. So I think the combination, Bill, has helped me kind of understand the tech and I've been really just thinking about the literacy, so we'll kind of combine those two things today. So as we go through um, throughout our throughout our day today, what I want to kind of focus on, I went ahead and um, shared our presentation with you, and just remember, um, as as we go through the presentation, as you go through the entire day, that the that hashtag the Ed Collect. The Ed Collab Gathering is the hashtag for the conference today, and then number two, that is our session number. So, if you have questions as we go through, or you're looking for just some just some information, or have comments around this, you know, please please tweet at us. We will be monitoring that throughout our the next hour um, for our session, and we want to really give you an opportunity to to interact with us. And that first that first piece of interaction, what I want you to do. Um, for those of you who are listening here today, I want you to go ahead and I want you to think back. And I want you to really think about that first opportunity. Do you remember the first time you got online? If you do, go ahead and tweet to us um, and if, you're, if you're watching this live at the Ed Collab Gathering. And again, number two, do you remember that first time that you got online? What was your experience getting online? Where were you? How did you... How, what were you doing? 
And I really want you to think about that because as you as we go through and we think about you know what it means to be in this digital world today, where we came from is important. And our thinking around where we got online first becomes part of becomes part of our culture. And I want to so let me tell you where I was that first time that I got online. My first experience getting online, I was in college and I was working in the computer lab. It was that one computer class that I had to take as a um, as a college student, as an education major, and that was the only one that I was really intended to take. And I was sitting there and our teachers got us online and I was, I mean, essentially I was we got, they got us into a chat room, and that first moment, I was out. I mean, really, I was I was chatting with somebody, and I was pretty sure that they were across the room. Like the entire the entire idea of somebody being across the world was foreign to me. And many of you, I would I would guess that if you really if you really think about it, you may have you may have um, moments where. You remember that dial-up modem sound, and I was going to play it for you, but I figure, you know, at some point, you know, that that just causes angst for a lot of people. That, you know, they they remember clicking on connect and going and getting a sandwich, and then when they came back, they were, you know, maybe that page was loaded, or maybe they actually had, you know, somebody was in the house and they accidentally picked up the phone. And you got kicked off. And one of the, actually one of what one of my friends did was they saran wrapped the phone so that nobody would pick it up uh, because they didn't want to get kicked offline. And so if you think about the ways that but that first time that you were online, you know whether that be in a chat room or a bulletin board, you know images. It wasn't the World Wide Web like it was now. At least for me, when I got online, it was back in 1992, and Getting online in 1992 was very different than getting online now. And so I want you to think about that. I want you to remember that as we, as we go through, that that first experience that you had, that is an experience that none of your current students really have. They don't remember having to click on something and, and go get something to drink or you know, having it take 10 minutes for something to actually show up. So that's an important thing just for us to remember that we are in a different space than so many of our kids were just because of our our own experiences. And so what I ask is what does this mean for literacy and what does this mean for reading? If we live in this world where we have we have access anytime anywhere, what does that mean for reading? In some cases, it means that reading is getting lost for kids. In other cases, it means that reading is doing that kids are doing more reading that they than they ever have. And every time that they're every time that they're reading, they are being in they're influencing something that they will create in the future. So how do they actually create their world, and how do they actually go about making things based on the reading that they are doing? And that's where that's where I find this whole idea of digital reading to be fascinating because many of you I'm sure remember the great rubber band bracelet craze of a few years ago and these are actually the hands of my own children I have twins Max and Molly they're 11 years old now three years ago they were deep into rubber bands and you can see that they they both created lots and lots of stuff here but in that process you know really what I was thinking about and what, as I was watching them, is they were creating things based on everything that they had been that they had been consuming, that they had been reading online and watching in videos. Because really, if you're going to create something in today's world, or you want to learn how to do something, YouTube is a great place to go. And so that begs the question: Where does how does YouTube influence our reading? How does it influence the way we consume things? And how does it influence our creation? And so they were creating lots of stuff. They were creating rubber band bracelets. They were doing an amazing amount of YouTube watching. And then one day my daughter, Molly, came and said, you know what? I, Dad, can we, can we make a video? 
And I said, you bet we can make a video. Why do you want to make a video? And this is this is a picture of Max and Molly making a video. And I said, why do you want to make a video? And they said, well, because you know we've learned so much from so many other people, um, and we we know how to do this. So we want to give back to those people. We want to be the people that people come to to learn how to do this. I said, great, so let's make a video. He said, how do we do it? I said, how do you think you do it? And they came up with the iPad. So at first, my son was not holding the iPad. It was perched very precariously on that box. Um, we, we decided to take a different route and had him actually hold on to the iPad as his sister was doing that. Well, about halfway through, Molly says to me, Dad, can we edit this video? I said, you bet we can. Why do you want to edit it? And she said, essentially, um, because nobody wants to watch me make a bracelet for 20 minutes. I said, you're right. How do you know that? They said, because nobody, because I don't want to watch anybody make a bracelet for 20 minutes. And so that recognition had everything to do with what she had consumed before. And we, we think about consuming so much, at reading as consuming, that this kind of creation process brings forth that active consumer, active reading kinds of conversations that we can have with kids that make it different. And one of the things that Frankie and I started um, when we met, we met back in 2007, and we were on the NCTE Executive Committee together. And what part of that work was, was to create this definition of 21st century literacies. And um, not only create that, but create a framework to go around it for teachers. So if you're unfamiliar with the NCTE definition of 21st century literacies, or the framework for a curriculum and assessment that goes along with that definition, I highly, check, I highly recommend you check that out through NCTE because one of the biggest pieces here that I really like, it talks about as society and technology change, so does literacy. As things change around our world, and, and YouTube being just one of those examples. YouTube, I know for my own kids, YouTube has changed the way they interact with information. It has changed literacy, and it has changed their view of the world and the way that they give back to the world. So they, you know, they, they created their video. They posted it online. They were excited about it, and they had a great experience around creating that video, but it had everything to do with what they had been consuming in the past. And so, I'm going to say again, as, as society and technologies change, so does literacy. Literacy has changed. Literacy has changed in a great many ways, and that's really what the, the focus of our book is, that digital reading book, it's, it's around how literacy changes in our world. And so, Today we're really going to focus on three different things. We're going to focus on our three kind of uh, hallmarks of digital reading and the things that we really highlight in, in our book. And first one is authenticity and remaining authentic inside of our classrooms and and really understanding that we need to we have to give it's not a it's not a option now we have to give kids authentic experiences around both traditional and digital text in order for them to be able to be considered and to consider themselves literate in our society and in our world right now um, our second one that we're going to focus really on today is going to be intentionality and that is really just our mindful planning and really keeping in mind what kids are going to be doing and what our goals are so that we keep kids first in that entire practice. And then our third one being connectedness and how do we stay connected and how do we stay not just connected to how do we connect to texts but how do we connect to the world outside of that text and the world outside of our classroom and so those are those are our three things that we're really going to focus on here and and work to to make connections through Frankie's classroom and through the work that we've done in our um, for for our book and one of the things that I really want to focus on here is what re digital reading is and what digital reading is not. It's really difficult to define digital reading as a whole, but really if you think about it in this way, well, the things that digital reading are, first of all, they're fluid. 
Okay, there, there are things that are going to be kind of ever-changing, and it's based on the resources and the tools that we have available. But it's ongoing and embedded. It's about understanding. It's active. Digital reading is not a passive experience any more than reading, traditional reading is. It's intentional. It's flexible, and it's about choice. At the same time, in that second column there, what's digital reading not? First of all, it's not a one-time event. It's not something that you do for a single lesson during the school year and say that, okay, we've, we've given kids experiences around digital texts. We're done. Now we're going to go back and teach our books. Okay? We have, to, we have to kind of figure out how to have that as an ongoing thing. It's not about the technology. It's not about how many iPads you have or what kind of tools are, you know, the technology that's available to you. It's about understanding. It's not passive. It's active. It's not random. It's not just something that we do. So much of our surfing that we do on a regular basis is random, and it's just following links here and there. How can we be intentional about that? How can we make it so it doesn't have to be linear? Because digital reading is not linear, and digital reading is certainly not the same experience for everyone. And so those are the those are the kind of if you were, if we're looking at kind of differentiating between digital reading, what it is and what it's not. That's a pretty um, that's a pretty good list of what we believe are the characteristics around digital reading. And as we go through each of our pieces, as we go through authenticity, as we go through connectedness, and as we go through intentionality, please feel free to post questions, comments at the Ed Collab Gathering number two. Um, tweet at. Bill Bass or at Frankie Silverson, and we will um, do our best to kind of field those questions and and field those comments as we go throughout the as we go throughout the next uh, half hour or so. So um, I'm gonna let Frankie talk a little bit about her classroom now and and talk about where those things are gonna fall and what they look like now. Okay, so it's. I think we're in like day 17 of school right now, and I've got third graders, so they're eight, and things take a long time logging onto the computer, learning how to scroll on an iPad, and you know, I keep, I remember every year how slow um, and how patient I have to be, and my favorite story this week, um, we were starting to look at blogging, and I was showing my kids some blog posts from last year, and you could see their eyes do that thing that writers do where they, they want to do everything that they see, like they see a video on a blog, and they want to do that, and they see a slideshow, and they want to do that, and one of my kids said, what, when are we going to learn all this? And I said, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we're really going to kind of dig into some of these tools and learn what you can do on your blog. I said, we can't learn it all today. And he looked at me and said, maybe we can. And <laughs> maybe they can, but I, as a teacher, I don't have the energy to teach it all in one day. Um, and I know, like, it takes the intentionality and the thinking as a teacher to make sure if I want things to be authentic and I want my kids to be really immersed in authentic things. It can't just be about learning all the tech there is to learn. I've got to embed it and it is definitely harder every year because my vision gets bigger in terms of what I know kids can do. So I'm just going to kind of show you. We're on day, I think we just finished day 17 of school. So I'm going to show you where we've been in terms of um, our, our classroom so far. Is my screen sharing? Yeah, okay. Um, so just kicking up the school year in terms of what I need to think about. Um, it, it seems bigger than um, than what I what I um, thought early. So when I think about authenticity, I'm going to talk a little bit about that first. First off, when I think about authenticity, it really has to be about kids and books and um, literacy that we know. We don't get rid of one to, to add the other. So my room is filled with books. We talk about authors. That is still a huge um, thing in our room. But if I really think about authenticity, I've also had to put together what um, Catherine Mir calls a, a hub in our classroom. So we have a Weebly that has lots of places for kids to read online, lots of sites that I know are or will be accessible to my third graders. I also have to think about that video piece that Bill talked about. If I believe that reading workshop is more than just reading text, um, are there informational videos like Friends for Fins or things like that that I want my kids to have access in during reading? And so it's really me acknowledging what biases do I have in terms of what counts in digital literacy. And I think that is a really tricky part for me. Um, I, I think there is a balance, especially when you're teaching kids at younger ages, um, who are just learning to read. I definitely 
want them to understand text, but I also want them to understand that consuming video is, is one form of reading right now. So making that authentic, authentic piece by just acknowledging what people read. The other thing that I've noticed, um, every year for probably 20 years I've had people in the building or parents come in and talk to what my kids about their lives as readers. And um, this is my principal and my assistant principal. They came in there, one of the first two to come in. And it's just interesting how things have changed. When they talked about themselves as readers, you can see that Jen has her laptop under um, her stack of books. You can see that Gabe on the right has his iPad because that's where he reads the news. And so I'm just really building on those things for kids that most readers in the world don't rely on one kind of reading, that the devices become just part of um, who they are as a reader. So that's changed. Um, the other thing that's changed is I usually give my kids a reading interview at the beginning of the year, and I'm, I'm amazed every time I look back at what I did the year before, how many times I say the word book. When I, when I want my kids to find themselves a re as a reader, how many times do I say the word text? And I'm trying to get rid of that language to really ask my kids what kinds of things they like to read, what they read online, um, what their experiences are um, with electronic um, devices, things like that. So just really trying to get rid of that word book to keep it a little bit more open so that my kids see reading as something a little bit bigger um, than we have in the past. Um, and then we have a bring your own device um, policy which is interesting in third grade. Um, what's happened this year is we started bring your own device earlier so when I look at my reading workshop even by week two I had a few kids bringing in devices so devices sit right next to um, notebooks which I have to say I'm sitting here with a piece of paper and a pen, a laptop, my phone, another laptop, and I think we want we want that for kids. We want them to see all the devices in use so that they can start to see authentic uses of these tools. Um, and then I'm going to just talk for a minute about the, the reading workshop in general. I think one of the things that we, we talked about that I'm going to unshare for a minute. One of the things that we talked about was really thinking about how we make sure we're authentic across reading workshop. For a while, my kids were able to read independently on devices. They were able to read um, during that independent time, but I never pulled in technology during small group instruction. My mini lessons were never about choices we make about online reading. When we shared, I never focused on that. So I feel like that piece is a really important piece, and um, one of the things that I try to do to ask, I try to ask myself um, as, I'm, as I'm teaching is, how do I use these things? And we, we created a list of questions that there's a link to on the bottom of the slide. Um, what role do these things play in each one, of, each piece of my reading workshop? Do I choose read alouds? Do I read aloud always a text that's a traditional book? Or does sometimes my read aloud come from a blog? And so I've tried to be really careful about um, using some Kindle versions of books already this year. I've tried to be really intentional about making sure all of my reading doesn't come from a piece of paper or a paper book, that sometimes um, we're pulling up a blog post to read aloud. Sometimes for many lessons I'm using something digital. And that takes some work because I think it's really easy to make sure, I know my books, and so to know the digital, the digital pieces is really um, a stretch for me, but to keep it authentic I have to do that. Um, one of the other things, and this Kristen Zemke has taught me over and over again, and it's really about the thinking, not the tech. And so I've tried really hard um, to be authentic. We do a lot of book previewing when we're reading things aloud. So we started the book Galaxy Zach last week, and I always do a preview where we look at the cover, we look at the back cover in third grade. Um, it's really important for kids to kind of get a sense of the book before they get into it as they build their stamina. So this year, um, for one of the books, we just did it on Poplet instead. Same kind of thinking, um, and I've kind of blacked out the, the photos, but you can see there's the cover of the book, there's the inside flap, there's the back cover, there's the first page, and what are we learning as readers as we look at each of these places? So same kind of thinking, but my kids were seeing Poplet being used as a web kind of tool um, in a way that was really authentic, and I didn't have to really mention Poplet or talk about Poplet, but they see that it's being used just like I use a piece of chart paper. Um, and just like I don't really talk about the chart paper we're using, I didn't really mention Poplet except kids asked, what is that? And I said Poplet, and that was the end of it. So the thinking was really about the book. So keeping things authentic in ways of using tools that I would use anyhow is, is pretty key. The most important thing I think I've used is that I don't need, that I've learned is that I don't have to know it all. And Bill will attest that I do not know um, a lot of the tech. Um, but I don't like to know the details of how a tool works. I had my kid use Google, used Google Draw yesterday, and I found that if I know enough to show them five minutes, I, um, if you've read the book, The First 20 Hours by Josh Kaufman, um, he says you just need to learn enough that you can practice and self-correct. And so that's what I'm learning with my kids. If I 
can introduce a tool. Yesterday I introduced Google Draw in a math lesson and I introduced about three pieces of the tool and kind of sent them off. They knew just enough to practice and self-correct, so I don't need to know all the stuff. I don't need all of my kids to know everything that every tool does before they use it. We're just, just kind of jumping in. So one of the things that has really helped me is these charts I build in my room every year. And this one in our room started this week. Um, once kids get good at things, I'm really good at Google Sign and I can help you. I am really good um, at adding a snapshot to your Google Doc. I can help you. I am really good at just logging into the computer if you need help. I am really good at finding that at sign. Um, I'm really good at doing the underscore. I'm really good at tabs in Google. Um, we start this about this week, so kids get really used to, I don't know how to do this, but I know someone in the class does, and you can see that list has grown. Um, what you see in blue, my kids did probably day one of this week, and then the rest of it was built as the week went on. So I don't have to spend a lot of time, if I want to be authentic, talking about the technology. My time is really spent um, talking about the literacy. So when I think about intentionality, whoops, ah, I lost something there. Um, when I think about intentionality, um, I really have to think about choice. I, you know, our kids can't be intentional without choice. They can't possibly um, be intentional if I'm making all the choices for them. So a lot of um, my work is putting a lot of choices out there, knowing that kids aren't going to do them all. And I have to be really comfortable knowing that some kids might never blog this year, and that's fine. Google might be their tool of choice. But I have to build enough choices in the kids become really intentional. So we have a classroom blog, we have a Twitter account, we have a website, we have a Weebly, um, we have a couple Symbaloo pages. There were a couple years that I had a Goodreads account. Um, so those kinds of things um, are key. I have to build lots of them if I want my kids to be intentional with their choices. One of my big ahas a few years ago um, was Michelle. Um, we were doing a science experiment, I think, and we were they were charting something about paper towels and kids were grabbing paper and Michelle decided to make a table on on pages on the computer and so she pulled up the laptop and she said yeah, I'm gonna make a table on the laptop on, on pages and I said oh, okay honey do you need help with that and she went uh, no and she kinda did that eye roll that the kids do when they know something that we assume they don't know and it was a really good um, lesson for me because I've never taught kids anything about creating a table on pages they've not had a lot of experience on pages but I had created tables on the smart board or with the um, with the projector together as we did science things and as we did um, different kinds of charting. So she'd seen me do that, so she was able to just jump in and do it as easily as she would have on paper. So I realized then that I don't have to teach these tools, um, if, but I do want kids to be intentional. Like, why did you choose to get on the laptop instead of grabbing a piece of paper? That's the, that's the question that I need to focus on. Um, so again, sometimes we take questions that we have before we read and we use chart paper and post-it notes and sticky notes and everyone adds theirs. Sometimes we use an online tool. This is um, Corculus that I learned about from Catherine. Um, same kinds of thinking. If you, if you think about those two tools, same kinds of thinking. We are tracking our thinking about the book. We're either using an online tool or we're using our digital tool or we're using paper. Either way, the focus is on our thinking. But in the meantime, kids see the possibilities and um, can become more intentional about their use of tools. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier was that I did that Google form. Um, this year, uh, the reading interview. I did a writing interview this year that kids just filled out about their own writing and goal setting. And what I noticed um, is just kids filling out the form. Sometimes we invite kids to create things that they've never experienced as users. So I'm being really um, intentional about making sure kids use a lot of the tools as users and as readers before they um, go out and, and try to create those. So as readers, how do you read a form? I think that's something that we never really had to do before, but um, kids are very busy doing that. Um, and then we have the same conversations. This was a math um, lesson the other day. We have the same conversations um, about whether you use a dry erase board or a piece of paper and a pencil or whether you use a laptop or a piece of paper or an iPad or a piece of paper. So that conversation about tools and intentionality is um, important no matter what the tool, no matter if the tool is a 100 chart or if the tool is uh, explain everything on the iPad. So some questions that I keep in mind, um, and this is just a partial list from our writing, you know, what tools do you need? How can the tools support you as a reader and writer? Um, you know, what decisions are you making as a reader and writer in terms of that intentionality? So if I want my kids to be intentional, I have to be as um, intentional about using a dry erase board and the questions I ask about that. Um, I had a couple kids last week deciding whether to get up and get a dry erase board or whether their notebook was a, was a tool that would work for them. And I think that that has that is as important of a tool. I don't think the kids see that as anything different, and I have to make sure that for me, 
um, those questions are the same no matter if the tool is digital or not. And then this is a, a bulletin board from a colleague I teach with, Cami Wenning. Her third grade classroom, um, they built this board together last year really thinking about the best tools to share their thinking and why you would use certain tools. So I think that whole intentionality piece only comes if kids have a lot of choices. If we only use kid blogs or if we only use Pixie or if I tell everybody we're all going to make a video this time or we're all going to read Pebble Go, I think we take the choice away. We take kids' intentionality away. Um, this is my favorite intentionality lesson. Last year my kids were doing an EdCamp session. They were um, presenting to each other. Um, they were doing a bouncy egg experiment. And so they were planning it on Google and they decided they were going to make a poster and this was toward the end of the year and these were two girls who were very good at um, <coughs> making slideshows and doing all kinds of cool things and I said, I said we're going to show them how to do this by making a poster and I said oh do you want to take a photo of the poster and put it on Google so kids can access it, how are you going to do that? They said no thank you, this is just our plan. And so the fact that they were very intentional about making a poster, the fact that they knew they could do something different but they didn't want to, I have to respect that. Um, I have to respect that they thought a poster there made a lot more sense as presenters and that it helped them as an audience as your eight-year-old. So it was probably a better choice for eight-year-olds than <coughs> it would have been for adults. So I just kind of have to keep the decision making with them. And then the last piece is connectedness and um, I'm just going to go through this fast and then we'll open up um, for questions. The, the piece about connectedness for me is especially with younger kids, they have to see the power of connectedness inside the classroom and what it does for their learning before we can take them outside the classroom. So a couple of things um, that I'm thinking about, if you know Ruth Ayers and Christy Overman's book, they say the best place to learn the nuances of social media is in school, but it's only possible if teachers establish an online presence as a classroom. And so that presence that we're establishing is a slow one. It, it definitely takes time for kids to see the power of it, but it has to happen inside first. So I read, I don't know if you read the Read It Forward Nerdy Book Club post that was up a couple weeks ago, but Linda Kay talks about the power of reading, reading it forward, passing books on to other people who would like to read them. And so I share that with my kids and we create a Read It Forward bookmark. And so if they read a book that they think is great and they want to share it with somebody in our class or somebody in, down the hall or one of the people that came in and talked about their reading, they can actually hand that person the book. So I want them to see the connections readers make inside our classroom and inside the school before they see the power, you know, as they're seeing the power outside of the walls of our classroom. Um, the other thing we've tried to do is we've tried to um, connect kids within the classroom. One of the things I found after teaching third through fifth grade, my third graders are really interested in what their friends think about them more than what the global world thinks um, about their work and, and that changes usually like around eight or nine but they're very interested in sharing their work with their friends. So we've got Padlet going, we've got kid blogs going, we've got Google Mail going where kids can share within our classroom and within our school um, and then we're going to grow that out but that first piece of reading, these first couple of weeks of reading, we're sharing reading our reading on a Padlet that's closed to our classroom. We're sharing our reading on kid blogs which is closed to our classroom. We're emailing about our reading um, so that they can see the power of connecting with other readers. Um, and then we're going to also connect um, with hashtags. Again, we're starting um, ed camps and genius hours and kids are presenting to each other. So they're really thinking about what it's like to be a presenter and what it's like to be an audience. And that too, if they don't know what it's like to learn from other people and what it feels like to to learn new things from friends, it's really hard to see the power of that connected reading and that connected learning. So this week um, we finished up some kids taught their friends different things that they were good at, like anything, I'm doing a cheerleading move to doing a push-up to making a paper airplane and we just talked about what it was like as a learner to be a presenter and what it was like as a learner to be the audience and we'll connect, you know, as this continues through the year, we'll connect with the hashtags EdCampKids and Genius Hour. Um, and then the global read alouds coming up. That's usually the first time with third and fourth graders that we connect really globally that um, I notice the kids seeing a, um, a big shift in their understanding of what it means to connect globally. This is usually the time in October when we put something out there with global read aloud and another class responds and that class might be from Colorado or might be from Australia and they see that, that our thinking is affecting someone else's thinking and vice versa. So I know that I'm building to that um, as we go. And then, if you don't know these hashtags, these are three hashtags that we've been using. Um, classroom Book A Day, Jillian Heisey started. We're ending every day with a book and we're tweeting it out. And we'll follow um, other classrooms who are doing the same thing. Readergrams, Catherine Hale started last year on Five Book Friday. 
I think Katie Matera started. So just three hashtags that will connect readers outside of our classroom. But um, I feel like my kids get this piece, but they're still much more interested in connecting within our classroom. Um, so again, that patience piece and really thinking about um, how, how our kids see connections in general as learners before um, we assume that they see the power of the connections outside of the classroom is important. Um, one of the things, and I'm going to I'm going to unshare my screen for a minute. One of the things that we found when um, we talked about reading workshop was there wasn't really a definition of digital reading workshop out there. Um, there was not, um, you know, it, it's pretty new. We haven't really thought about what, what, it, what digital tools have done for reading workshop. So one of the things that Bill and I did, we really thought about what, what, is, what does digital reading workshop do? And we have a lot of good friends who are thinking the same things. And so we want to make sure that our or that we keep in mind what we know about reading workshop when we think about this and to keep that in mind any reading workshop that we've ever run has been kind of a slow patient start and so kicking off the school year I know having everything in place isn't going to happen but the things that we want to keep in mind are key so this is a lot of text but we kind of want to end and get ready for the question and answer part of this with this definition and I'm going to read it to you um, I'm going to read it to you um, one slide at a time just so that you can kind of get a sense of what we think reading workshop is. And, and for me, this is, this is about what am I going for? You know, if I can keep this vision in my head, how can I be authentic, intentional, and connect my readers in a way that's going to really make sense for my kids um, and, and their literacy lives? So what we said was we believe that digital reading workshop is a structure that believes in young readers. It's a structure that honors authenticity, intentionality, and connectedness. It is a structure that allows each reader to grow and be supported based on individual needs. But most important, Digital Reading Workshop is a time where young readers develop the habits and behaviors they will carry with them throughout their lives. They will learn to be intentional and active readers who know what is possible. It is in our Digital Reading Workshops that our students will learn the power of community both inside the walls of the classroom and beyond. So really thinking about um, that helps me to slow down a lot at the beginning of the year and not rush to to necessarily use all the pieces of um, technology that I know my, are going to give my kids power, but to really slow down to make sure that um, those tools are worth it for them and they're not just using them um, because they're fun or because um, it looks good when someone walks in my room or because I want to hurry up and get everything out there. I really have to think about um, our vision for, for reading workshop. So this brings us to, you know, now that First of all, you know Frankie's Frankie's classroom and the the uh, the activities and all that. Is she really is intentional about thinking how she is going to move that forward throughout her throughout the year and have that long term plan is is fascinating and amazing um, and just really pretty fantastic. But the but the question becomes now: How will you respond if you are if you are a if you are an educator that is working with, well, an educator working with kids, there we go. Um, but if you're an educator that is is thinking in this, how do, how do you respond when we know that we have to give kids opportunities for authenticity, that they have opportunities for intentionality as teachers, and, and not just as teachers, it's not just us being intentional, it's kids being intentional as well. And kids being intentional about what they're choosing to read and how they're choosing to read it, and the path that they're taking as they as they make this journey. How do we respond? How do we respond when we have opportunities and we want to give kids opportunities for collaboration and connecting outside the classroom? Is that just that we Skype with an author or do a hangout with an author? That's that's a part of it, but there's so many more opportunities that are there to connect not just with individuals who are creating these texts, but really to connect across classrooms, inside your building, outside your building, in so many different ways. And that's where that's where the hashtags come in, and that's where the um, that's where the the teaching back and forth in the classroom and giving kids opportunities. One of the things that I've that I've been thinking a lot about recently. Um, in terms of my response, in, in my district, we have moved to digital textbooks in our middle school. And so our middle school social studies doesn't, doesn't really do um, traditional textbooks anymore. Yet, many of our 
elementaries, our elementary kids moving into sixth grade, really don't haven't had those experiences around digital text. So how are we going to respond in order to create a create a space where kids in elementary school have opportunities to understand and use a variety of digital texts because it's not just a one-to-one -one transfer. And uh, Kristen Zemke, who is actually presenting right now, she wrote a great post um, about how it's not either or, it's both and. That we need to give opportunities for not just do we choose technology or do we choose a traditional text, but how can we do both? And how can we bring those together? And I think that's really what the what the key question is here for me is how do we respond, knowing that we need to have those three hallmarks of reading, and we need to have those three pieces to be digitally literate and to be able to read in our digital space. How do we respond now as educators? And so, um, if we, I don't know if we, I, I'm, I was looking through our. Um, Twitter feed, and I don't know if there are questions that have come up through it. I haven't seen. Frankie, did you see any questions? I think there's one about where to access our slides. Oh, okay. Well, we can make um, that. I will post that right now. One moment. Yeah, I didn't see any questions come up, but... I was busy. It's <laughs> hard to, to follow the Twitter, Twitter feed and do this. This is good. Um, yeah, lots of comments, lots of really good thinking in terms of even just how people got online and first times they got online and what they're doing in their classrooms. All right, so yeah. I'm posting that right now. Um, and so I guess... I, since there aren't any specific questions that we're seeing, um, you know, I guess I guess what I want to oh here we go. Where can I see the slideshow? So I'm posting that right now. Um, is this two batteries? This isn't two batteries, is it? <laughs> Where are you posting that, Bill? I'm posting it on Twitter. Oh, okay. Um, here are slides for the digital reading session. Um, there's a question here, too, Bill, how, um, how to support this, and you, you'll be able to answer this one better than I do, how to support this as a librarian that only sees a student once in six days, since you oversee the librarians in your district, or you, that comes from Pam. So, so Pam, um, one of the things that I am, I, I am responsible for our library program in my district, and, you know, that's a great question, so how do you support this as a librarian who only sees students one in six days, and I. So what I ask, what I ask my librarians to think about, really is, um, you 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 support this by supporting teachers and by supporting their thinking and their ability to um, explore this topic, not necessarily as you being the one teaching those kids, because. One of, one of the things that I, I really think about is at, with, with library, we have to think about our influence on the building, not our influence on those kids that we see once a week. We are absolutely going to have that influence on that once a week basis, but in order to really, to really get this as a practice, it has, to, it has to be in classroom, and it has to be embedded in classroom, not inside of a, that, a special half hour or maybe even an hour time period once a week. Um, I see that I see that as the same thing for like digital citizenship. Digital citizenship can't just live in the library. Digital citizenship has to be something that everybody owns and talks about naturally as opposed to we're going to do a lesson on this. And so if, if you think back to the um, right at the beginning I had those I had those um, what digital reading is and what digital reading is not, you know, as a librarian, one of the things is it's not a one-time event and it can't be something that you only do. And so I would encourage you to think about how you can influence your building to, and the, and the teachers in your building to try out some of the tools and some of the uh, strategies that Frankie was talking about. And then there's another one on what does it look like in middle school? Since periods are shorter, 
So, so I think uh, I'll speak to that one too. I think that in middle school classroom, it's not, you know, it's about the opportunities. Um, yeah, the the class periods are shorter, and the the experiences that kids have, um, they have to be a little more. We have to be more intentional as educators in order to create opportunities for that for those kids. So not just um, giving them not just saying okay we're going to do this now as a class but really try to differentiate with kids and and give them opportunities where it's not teacher directed but they can make those choices and I think that's where um, you know when we think about it in terms of authenticity it's about choice when we think about it in terms of connectedness it's about how can we let individual kids connect outside of our classroom or, or small groups of kids and then um, intentionality how can we be intentional about giving them um, opportunities. It's not all that different inside of, from elementary to middle school because it's about the opportunities that we pro that we provide and expect as opposed to um, the the projects and activities that we go through. And if I can jump in there, I think one of the um, pieces I learned is that it's not any more time. It might be more kids reading on devices or me having to find more resources to give kids choice, but it's still the reading workshop and it's still the same amount of time. So you know, I think it's just being intentional. Those questions that we shared about how are you embedding these things and all the pieces of the workshop really helped me to see that it wasn't necessarily more time. It was just me knowing um, digital resources as well as I knew the traditional ones. Um, I saw one last question here from Marissa, um, and I'll start and then you could kind of wind it up. But where do you think is a good starting jumping point for teachers? And I really think I really think anywhere is a good starting point. Um, this year, I I started more with Google because I was more comfortable with it. I think as a teacher, if we start with something we're comfortable with, it's going to grow, and I don't think there's any sequence of where to start and what to do. I think for me, if I keep my eye on the authenticity piece and only ask kids to do what I would do as a reader and writer, and I keep the, the focus on the reading piece, I can start anywhere, and then it's going to naturally grow as I see the power that that has in kids and as kids. Kids have outgrown what I know within you know hours every, every day when I introduce something new, so I think anywhere is a good place to start. I think... I think sometimes teachers wait until they know a lot or they have a really, um, you know, a real firm decision on what the best place to start is, and I think that holds us up a lot. So I think just start, and if it doesn't work, start somewhere else and, and, and figure it out as you go because I think none of us have the answers to this, so wherever we start is the right place to start. I would also, the only thing I would add on to that is the other place that you can, uh, that you can start is by asking your kids. Asking them where they're interested in starting, where their interests lie, what kinds of things they're experimenting with outside of schools, um, outside of the classroom, and, and really having that conversation. Um, there is one more question, Frankie, and I think this is best for you, so maybe you can go through this pretty quick. How does one, this is from Julianne, uh, how does one manage choice with digital literacy in the Reader's Workshop? Okay, so... I manage it the same way I manage books. Um, right now, I have six computers in our classroom, four laptops, a desktop, and my laptop, and we have two iPads, and we have Bring Your Own Device. So right now, kids are really signing up, um, and we're signing up by saying, who really needs a tool tomorrow, and why do you need it? So I can build in, like, if you're gra grabbing a computer, it's not because you just want to bop around. You have a, a decision as a reader. As the year goes on, they're just going to grab things like they grab a book. And so if somebody's looking for the second book in a series, and they have it, but somebody else needs it, they have that conversation, can have that book when you're finished, that's no different with the devices. So um, it does feel just like when I only have one copy of a favorite Diary of Olympic Kid book in the room, it feels just like that at the beginning. Um, and there are times when we have to back up and say who needs what today, and how's that going to work, but it's, it's just really authentic. I think it's just like at home, if somebody um, is doing something, like today I'm using my computer and my daughter's computer so she can't use it. You know, it's just that conversation that happens just like it happens about books. It's a little chaotic at first because I find that the kids just want the devices because it's new, um, but once it once they realize what works for them, it becomes um, pretty seamless. So, you know, I think you deal with the chaos for a little while just like you deal with the book chaos for a little while, and then um, we have a lot of conversations in our classroom. You know, here's the deal. You know, so-and-so has been on the devices all day for the last few days, and so-and-so needs them. What, what can we do? So it's a lot of those kind of conversations. Um, the, the build in the choice and the intentionality with limited limited devices. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, I think that um, 
you know, I, I guess what it comes down to is at this point, you know, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. But I, I really I really hope that this has um, kind of helped helped think, you know, and I and I see through the the Twitter chat that um, it, it, there are some there is some different thinking that is has occurred. But really, I'm gonna go back to our our final slide there. How will you respond? You know, like what do you do at this point? What do you do? with authenticity, intentionality, and connectedness. What do you do with digital tools? What do you do with digital reading? And how do we give kids more opportunities? Um, because it's it's about those opportunities. But one thing that I would caution is that it's not necessarily about the opportunities that we as teachers always value. Um, a lot of the reading and a lot of the um, the work that we can have kids do maybe doesn't fit into the thinking that we have or the preconceived notion about what digital reading is or what we need to do inside of a digital workshop, digital reading workshop, but really we have to value all of our kids' choices and voices and, and really give opportunities that may stretch us and help kids make connections in that. So I guess we'd like to thank you for your time today. And um, if there is anything else that you would like to kind of talk with us about, we're pretty easy to find online. Um, I'll share our I'll share our initial slide once one more time. That will uh, you know really if if there is anything that we can you know kind of talk with you about or think with you about, please connect with us online. And otherwise, um, thanks so much for spending an hour with us, and have a great rest of your day with the um, the Ed Collab gathering. And you know, be sure that you uh, be sure that you learn a lot and have a wonderful time. Yeah, thank you very much.